Tonight, we are talking about your heart health and heart rate and why it matters. Um, so like always, if you have any questions, just jump in or type them in the chat box and we'll get to them at the end. I think everybody knows who I am. Um, and uh, the reason that I like to do this is um, it's really hard to um, convey everything that people need to know about a fitness and health program in, you know, a blog post or an hour that you talk to them. So I'm hoping that these are helpful and uh, that, um, you know, you will get something out of them and that will um, personally benefit your own health and fitness. Um, as you all know, I, um, I like the I like the science. Um, so these are all evidence based uh, strategies. So let's get started. So isn't that beautiful? I am in love with this um, uh, graphic. <laughs> so we're going to talk about your heart rate primarily tonight, what to measure and why it is so important to measure it and how to know if you're recovering, because that's a big thing. Uh, people do one of two things typically when they exercise. Um, they don't recover enough or they don't exercise enough. We're kind of black or white. Um, and then a few tips to keeping your heart healthy because that's important as well. And exercise uh, is not the only thing you need to do. It is important, but it doesn't make up for a bad diet. So a few things. First, we're just gonna start with some facts about your heart. So we all, our heart is about the size of our fist. So obviously if you're bigger, your fist is bigger. So your heart will be bigger. Your heart beats about 115,000 times each day. So that's a lot of exercise. And it pumps about 7,500 liters or 2,000 gallons of blood every day. It has its own electrical system. It doesn't need your brain to tell it to fire. Um, so your cardiac conduction system means that your heart can continue to beat when it's disconnected from your body. That's why you can do um, heart transplants and uh, open and surgery, but um, we try to keep our heart inside of us. Um, the first open heart surgery uh, was um, done in 1893. I, I don't think I'd want to be the first person, um, but it was performed by Daniel Williams, who was also the one of the very first black cardiologists in the United States. And the first implantable pacemaker was um, not that long ago, it was used in 1958. And then the person who got the pacemaker lived longer than the surgeon who implanted it. The earliest case of heart disease uh, was found in a 35 year old, 3,500 year old Egyptian mummy. And the American pygmy shrew has the, is the smallest animal with the fastest heartbeat at 1200 beats per minute. And um, whales have the largest heart of any animal with the slowest uh, heartbeat. So um, it makes sense that the smallest animal would have the fastest heartbeat because it takes less time for the blood to circulate around your body. So typically uh, people who are smaller have a faster heart rate than someone who is bigger. Most heart attacks happen on a Monday and Christmas day is the most common day of the year for heart attacks to happen. And the next common day is when the time change happens. So um, we're really a sleep deprived um, society if that's the second highest day for heart attacks. Our heart weighs about 2.2 um, kilograms or one pound. Men's hearts are slightly bigger and heavier. Women's hearts beat slightly faster. The sound of your heart beating is because the, you can hear the valves opening and closing. And um, our heart-shaped symbol is actually from the sylphium plant, which was used as an ancient form of birth control. I think that's fantastic. Um, and if you stretched out all your blood vessels, uh, you would, it would uh, extend about 100,000 kilometers. Our heart cells don't divide once we are adults, so heart cancer is very 
rare and laughing is good for your heart. It reduces stress and gives a boost to your immune system. So those are just a few fun facts about your heart. And now we're going to talk about your heart rate and how to measure it and why it matters. So let's just take a look at this resting heart rate chart for a moment. Um, when you're at rest, your heart is pumping the lowest amount of blood to supply oxygen. And most healthy people, our resting heart rate is between 60 and 100 beats. You can see that may change um, with fitness as well as with age. Um, and um, resting heart rate at the low end tends to offer some protection against heart attacks especially with postmenopausal women. So in the Women's Health Initiative, which studied almost 130,000 postmenopausal women, they found that those with the highest resting heart rate, um, more than 76 beats per minute, were 26% more, more likely to have a heart attack than those with the lowest resting heart rate, so 62 beats per minute or less. Um, if your resting heart rate is consistently above 80 beats per minute, um, you should probably talk to your doctor about your heart health. You can lower your resting heart rate um, through diet, weight loss, and exercise, you know, the regular suspects. And um, generally, a lower heart rate implies that you're more efficient at heart function and you have better fitness. So someone who's very well-trained endurance athlete uh, may have a resting heart rate that's 40 beats per minute, regardless of their age. Um, so lower resting heart rate, as long as uh, that's not a sign of some other heart condition, is typically better because your heart has to work less hard when you're not doing anything. Um, why we want to measure our heart rate uh, is to exercise in the correct zone. People get really... Um, uh, sort of fanatical about this and uh, there's it, it's good to know but there's you can be kind of a little bit too obsessive about it but exercising in the right zone is like the Goldilocks management you don't want to go too slow or have your heart rate too slow because um, you're not going to get the benefits you want you want it to be too fast because you won't have be able to exercise long enough or recover and you don't want to be too erratic in terms of going up and down um, depending on your training program um, so measuring your heart rate and training in the right zone is very helpful. So we talk about our max heart rate. And what does that mean? It's just the greatest number of beats that your heart can reach during all out exercise. And probably everyone here knows that to measure your heart rate, they always say 220 minus your age equals your max heart rate. Um, that's a theoretical max. So if yours is consistently different than that, don't panic. It's a theory. Um, so max heart rates do vary from person to person. They, um, they are not an indicator of your physical fitness. And uh, knowing what your max heart rate is when you're exercising can be very useful. So um, typically you don't get it to your max. So for example, if you're 50, 220 minus your age would be 170. Typically, you wouldn't get your, be able to get your heart rate to 170. Um, that's the theory anyway. Uh, it can, you can. Some people might not be able to get anywhere near that. But knowing what's normal for you is really important. So your max heart rate is when it's working its hardest to meet your oxygen needs. So your max heart rate plays a large role in your aerobic capacity. So the amount of oxygen that you can consume and higher aerobic capacity is associated with a lower risk of heart attacks and death. Um, also, <laughs> really cool news is that um, people who raise their aerobic capacity, so they go from not being very fit to being a little more fit, um, improve their cognitive skills. So they have better tests of memory and reasoning. So you can see in the chart, you know, the zones here, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit more, but. If you're going less than 50%, that would be like a stroll. You're walking around, there's no strain. You could do it for a long time. Uh, 50 to 60%, you know, warm up, cool down, active recovery, um, you know, maybe walking a little bit faster. And then as you go up the scale, you're going to be able to hold that effort 
for less time. So as in zone five, so 90 to 100% of your max, that's you know 10 seconds to maybe 90 seconds if you're really fit. Um, most people when they're exercising fairly hard are in zone three. Um, and you can, uh, we're gonna talk about how you can measure these without a heart rate monitor. And if you do have a heart rate monitor, what's the best kind to get? I um, would say that if you were going to have one piece of equipment, if you only were gonna buy one piece of exercise equipment, that would make the most difference to your, uh, if you're you know, talking about how fit I wanna be, or if I wanna do something really well, or if you have a goal to achieve, um, a heart rate monitor is the best piece of fitness equipment that you can buy um, more than anything else that you could get. So typically, like I said, your heart rate is your age minus 220. And most people to be in aerobic training zone are between 50 and 85% of that. Um, but keep in mind that um, fitness and activity levels will determine if you can get that high. If you're a smoker, you're gonna affect your heart rate. The air temperature will affect your heart rate. If your body position, whether you're, you're standing up, your heart rate's gonna get higher than if you're lying down. Your emotions, how big you are, and if there's any, if you're on any medications that um, there's medications like beta blockers that um, keep your heart rate low, so you can't get them that high. So there's a wide range of normal. I can't stress that enough. Don't freak out if you don't get anywhere near these numbers. Um, and uh, you want to make sure that you get your heart rate in your training zone for the best benefits. Um, and there's simple ways to know if you don't have a heart rate monitor. But I'm going to talk a little bit about the training zones right now to, so you can understand how to measure how hard you're working. And um, your heart rate is the, one of the best indicators to, in, uh, to um, show how hard you're working and, um, and how much you should recover from that, from that workout. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, 50 to 60% of your heart rate. So that zone one is very low intensity and um, walking, you know, easy, easy exercise. Zone two, you know, it gets a little bit harder. Um, you're, if you're in zone two for longer, this is generally a really good way to improve general in endurance and to increase your muscular fitness because you increase your capillary density. So you have more um, blood supply to, those, ox to that, those working muscles. And then as you go up the scale, you start to use less fat as a fuel and more carbohydrates as a fuel. Um, and that's good. Uh, people think, oh, I'm, you know, a fat burning zone on the treadmill. That's where I want to stay. But you actually burn more calories and you have more oxygen debt. So you burn more calories longer if you can stay in a higher heart rate zone. Sorry, I can't move this. There we go. So how do you measure your heart rate? So there's the old fashioned way, take your pulse in your wrist. Uh, make sure you don't take it with your thumb because your thumb has a pulse or you take your pulse uh, in your neck. And that's, you know, that's simple to do, um, but it can be pretty hard if you're, if you're exercising at a, at a pretty intense level because you have to stop and count and think and multiply. Um, and that can be kind of challenging <laughs> if you're working out really, really hard. There's the wrist devices, so the wearable wrist devices. Um, they're fine. They're not that accurate. They're especially not accurate the harder you go. So the world's uh, largest clinical trial um, thought that, you know, uh, they, they advertise them as not a medical device, and that's true. They're really good for measuring activity levels and sort of giving you an idea of how you're changing or how you're active over time. But the, ac the accuracy is not intended to match something like a heart rate monitor that you wear a chest strap. It's, you know, they're definitely for recreational purposes and cause some heart rate readings to be inaccurate. There's a few other problems with uh, wrist strap. They have to be touching your skin. Um, 
And so if it's cold or you want to see the you want to see it, you have to wear it and then pull it back. You can't wear it on top of your clothes. Um, and the way they work is they measure light uh, through your artery. So they assume that when there's light is when your artery had lets more light through, um, your heart is not pumping. And when it uh, reflects, then the heart is pumping. So the blood in the in the arteries is what detects the level of your heart rate. So it's a very indirect measure of your heart rate. Um, and you know, there's there's good things and bad things about this. If you're a new exerciser, they're great. They give you an idea of what's happening, um, but they're they aren't that accurate. Uh, the other thing that I think about when I think about Fitbits um, is that, you know, they are Google just bought Fitbit for two billion dollars. They didn't buy Fitbit because um, they thought they could make a lot of money off a plastic bracelet they are buying the data that comes with your Fitbit. So even though they say it's an aggregate data, it's still your data. And um, Google's um, uh, statement on this is we will give Fitbit users the choice to review, move or delete their data. So if you trust Google with all your intimate bits of information, um, that's fine, but it seems a little bit more risky to me. And um, none of the other companies are any different. They sell that aggregate data to health insurance companies. So that's why those companies are worth so much money is not because they think they're gonna sell lots more of those plastic, uh, <laughs> plastic bracelets. Now, if you're talking about heart rate monitors, these are like EKG accurate. They are accurate within 99.6%. They are, um, you know, a little bit more uncomfortable to wear, especially if you have to wear a sports bra as well. Uh, but they have a really high accuracy. Um, you can wear the uh, watch, you know, anywhere on top of your clothes, under, you can use them for swimming. They're not affected by how intensely you're using them. So if you want to measure your heart rate accurately because you're interested in being as fit as possible or, um, you know, making some serious changes, uh, then I would recommend the chest strap. But if you just want to compare over time, you could use the Fitbit or the old fashioned way, which is a little bit more challenging when you have to do math when your heart rate is really high. <clears throat> but you can also use things like METs. So if you've been on a treadmill or somewhere in um, any gym, you might think, what is a MET? Because they always have a MET on there. So METs are metabolic equivalent and they are used to express the intensity of physical activity. Um, so your working metabolic rate is relative to your resting metabolic rate. So one MET is defined as the energy of sitting quietly. So the cost of sitting quietly, it's about the equivalent of uh, one calorie per kilogram of body weight per hour. So as activity increases and you use more oxygen, it's more MET. So five METs is five times harder than one MET. Anything above six is considered vigorous. Uh, this would be used for someone who's on beta blockers because they can't measure their heart rate. Um, it's, not, it's not an accurate measure, but this would be an, an accurate measure. So you can see that sleeping and watching television burn the same amount of calories. Um, and um, as you, you know, go up the, the scale in terms of vigorous activity, the METs also go up, but we don't use them very often and you're only going to see them if you're on a piece of stationary equipment. So what else can you do if you don't wanna have a heart rate monitor? You can use the rating of perceived exertion. This is really accurate. How you feel is very closely linked to what your heart rate actually is. <clears throat> So if you're doing something that's a seven or an eight, um, that's a good, you know, um, vigorous activity, you could answer someone in a sentence. Um, you wouldn't be able to sing the opera, that would be like a two or a three, but you could answer, you know, in a sentence. If you're getting to like a nine, you could maybe answer in a one word answer, it probably um, would be some kind of expletive because you'd be ready to stop. So um, it is a really, really accurate rating of perceived exertion. Um, 
and you can use it quickly. It's really closely linked to your heart rate and it's very useful if you're on medications as well that keep your heart rate low. Um, and it, it really is that's been studied extensively and this is um, quite similar to measuring your heart rate. So you don't need any fancy equipment as long as you're honest with how hard you're exercising. Um, so you can also use ratings of perceived exertion with strength training. It doesn't necessarily just mean with aerobic activity. And this is often when people get into trouble because when you start strength training, everything feels hard. And then as you go along, maybe everything feels like a three or a five. So you want to be thinking about um, how you want your strength training workout or your aerobic training workout to benefit you in the future. So you want to think maybe I should be working at a seven or an eight if I have some fitness goals. If I have health goals, I can sort of adjust that a little bit, but pretty much you should think I should be able to do Maybe a, I should feel like I'm at a seven or an eight in terms of how hard I'm working to get the benefits. So usually when you start a program, everything feels like a seven or an eight. And then as you get better, um, you know, you can just sort of go through the motions. Uh, you should be able to do a seven or an eight. It should be correctly. Uh, it should be done with, you know, in control, um, but you should still feel like it's hard enough. So why do we measure exercise intensity? <clears throat> so the more, the better you are at exercising, the more you exercise, the harder or the longer you have to do it to get the same benefit because you become more efficient. So one of the reasons that over time you feel like you aren't getting the same benefit from your exercise program is because you are getting stronger and fitter. So long distance activities, keeping your heart rate in an aerobic zone, um, will allow you to click complete the session, but you get fitter. And so you could add maybe some high intensity, short duration activities to get your heart rate up. You wanna think about um, your heart rate as kind of between an eight and a nine is kind of like the red line between where you will um, not be able to recover during that exercise session. So if you if you're, wanna do your best time somewhere, a 5k or hiking up a mountain or, you know, doing something that you normally do. And you think, I wonder how fast I can do this. If you start out at a nine, this is not going to be your best time because you're going to pay later. You're going to have to make up for that oxygen debt. So exercising at too high an intensity means that you're not going to maintain it, but exercising at too low an intensity like this Beagle <laughs> means that you're not going to get the benefits that you want. So heart rate is immediate feedback in terms of can I can I actually do this for as long as I need to do it? And am I getting the benefits that I want to get? Exercise intensity also um, refers to how much energy is expended when exercising. And uh, we want it, um, we know that exercise intensity has an effect on what type of fuel we use and what time ad adaptations our body makes after exercise. So intensity is really the amount of physical power that the body uses when performing an activity and heart rate is just an expression of that or a rating of perceived exertion. <clears throat> Sorry, I keep uh, not being able to go forward. Here we go. So heart rate in and recovery. Um, heart rate is a re like your resting heart rate, which measures your fitness. Recovery tells you a lot about your current state of health and fitness. And if you are recovering enough or if you need to recover more. Um, one thing that I tell people all the time is there's days when you just don't feel like doing the workout that you had planned to do. And sometimes you can't figure out, is this a motivation problem? Um, am I really just really tired and I should take a day off? Um, and it, some days it's hard to figure out if it's, if it's all in my head or really do I need to do, do I need to take a day off? So the easiest way to understand if you should take a day off is to use the 10 minute rule. 
So the 10 minute rule is I'll do it for 10 minutes. If I still feel like going home at the end of 10 minutes, I'll just go home. And typically, if you still feel like going home after 10 minutes, it's a good time to take a day off. Usually if we have, you know, if it's more, it's a motivational issue, you do it for 10 minutes, you start to feel better. Think, oh, this isn't so bad. And then you can carry on. The other way that you can tell if you need to take a day off is if your resting heart rate is higher than normal. If you do measure your heart rate regularly, a, a higher than normal resting heart rate indicates fatigue. It indicates maybe that you're getting sick um, before symptoms begin. So a resting heart rate that's not your normal does indicate something's up. And usually it means overtraining. So it's a really easy way to measure aerobic health. Um, ideally, we'd want you to measure your resting heart rate before you get up out of bed in the morning, but who remembers that? Uh, if you're lying on the couch, if you've just been meditating, anytime where you're relaxed and not moving, you can take your resting heart rate. So how do you know if, you're, if your training is benefiting you in the way that you want it to benefit you? And you can do that with heart rate recovery. So what you would do is do a workout that ends with a really hard effort. So you're trying to get your heart rate to max your max. And then you're going to slow down, like really slow down. You don't want to stop because your blood is now pumping to your legs as fast as possible and as much as possible. So when we exercise, blood is shunted from our organs and goes to our working muscles. And the muscle contraction is what pushes the blood back to our heart. So that's why it's such a bad idea to go for a super hard run and then just stop because all the blood is still pumping down to our legs and nothing is really pumping it back. And it's really easy to feel faint or too faint. So if you were doing a hard interval, let's just say, for instance, you're running, you know, you're doing 30 second sprints. So you would do maybe do 10 of them. And the last one is going to be the hardest and your heart rate is going to get up the highest. And then at the last one, figure out what your heart rate is, check your heart rate, and then just walk really slowly, like almost not moving, just enough to keep the blood pumping. And then you measure how fast your heart rate drops in 90 seconds. Um, and I forgot to tell you this at the beginning, but I have all these graphs in a little cheat sheet for you. So you'll everybody will get one of these. So if your heart rate drops 15, one five beats in 90 seconds, that would be would consider that average fitness that would be fine. Um, we'd like it to be 25 beats 25 beats would be a good aerobic fitness. So you go from 150 to 125 beats per minute in 90 seconds, you're a, that's a good fitness level. Anything above 50, like five zero is excellent. So that would be endurance athlete. So you wanna check this by going hard, as hard as you can go, and the going really easy and um, checking how fast your heart rate comes down in 90 seconds. And this is also a really good indication of your aerobic fitness and your recovery. So if you're not recovering enough, if you're overtraining, if you need to rest, your heart rate recovery will also be affected, just like your resting heart rate is affected. Um, some people talk about heart rate variability, which is the time between beats. Our heart rate is not like a metronome. It does not, if 60 beats in a minute does not mean there's one every second. There might be one every three quarters of a second and then 1.2 seconds. That is normal too. Having heart rate variability is very, very healthy. Having no heart rate variability is not healthy because it means that your heart is not able to change with stressors. Um, and that you're not gonna be able to measure really, um, not precisely, but knowing that having a, Un, a, a variable heart rate is healthier than having an absolutely steady heart rate all the time. So if you just jump up and do something, your heart rate should change. So even though you can't measure the, you know, the time between beats, your heart rate should be variable the healthier you are. So 
So let's talk about a few other things that affect our heart rate, namely our lifestyle and especially nutrition and how to stay healthy. So everybody, um, you know, everybody has a genetic risk for heart disease or other diseases, but really um, genetics don't make as much of a difference as lifestyle. So your lifestyle makes the biggest difference when it comes to heart disease. So things like what you eat, alcohol, uh, sleep, stress, and smoking are the big ones. <clears throat> and they did an interheart study showed that for men and for women, old and young, the nine potential risk factors that can be modified, so diet, exercise, smoking, weight, um, account for 90% of the risk of having a heart attack. So what you do every day is a greater risk for your heart for heart disease than um, your genetic risk. So when they followed these people over time, if you chose a healthy lifestyle, they had a 90% drop in risk, uh, which actually is correlated really well with type two diabetes also had a 91% drop in risk. So that's really good. So the same healthy lifestyle factors, um, not only reduce heart disease, but also reduce diabetes, which is closely linked to heart disease and stroke. So 80% of strokes are avoidable with simple lifestyle changes. How does that compare to drugs? Maybe you think I have, you know, low risk and whatever, They'll, there's a pill for that. Um, I don't think that anybody here is going to say that, but why change our diet and lose weight and start exercising if you could just take a medication? So uh, pharmacological therapies typically only reduce cardiovascular disease risk um, by about 20 to 30%. So lifestyle makes the biggest difference. If you have to take medication and you change your lifestyle, you can uh, further reduce the risk to about 78%. But really it's your lifestyle that makes the biggest difference when it comes to reducing the risk of heart disease. So I'm just going to talk a few minutes about our endothelial cells because they are super important. Um, endothelial cells are the lining of our blood vessels. So if we laid them all end to end from a person, they would wrap four times around the world. And um, they're not inert. They're very metabolically active. If you have to take statins, they're trying to re-engage keep your endothelial cells healthy. That's one of the things that statins do. So endothelial cells are sensitive to oxidation and inflammation. And if we don't take care of them, um, then we lose them dramatically. So every single serving of fruits and vegetables that you eat are associated with a 6% improvement in endothelial cell function. So every time you have fruit, or vegetables, you're improving your endothelial cell function. And it doesn't, and it's because of um, the antioxidants in the fruits and vegetables. They also studied, could you just take antioxidants and not eat fruits and vegetables? Unfortunately, those um, improvements don't come in a pill. You actually have to eat the fruits and vegetables. So a practical approach is whole foods, obviously, because they have numerous effects that work together. Endothelial cell dysfunction is the first step in the um, developing artery disease, heart disease, and stroke. And the, when, we, our heart, when our arteries decline in function, it's not because we're aging. Um, we can retain our arterial function that we had in our 20s well into our 60s and later. Um, they did a study on elderly Chinese adults who maybe in part because they um, had a very uh, vegetable-based diet and also drank a lot of green tea. They had lots of important dietary differences between the standard American diet and um, their diet, but they had uh, China, their, their arteries had the same youthfulness as someone in their 20s. So what are some heart healthy foods? Uh, turmeric is very popular. It's an anti-inflammatory food. Um, 
and about a teaspoon a day is is um, thought to have the same benefits as doing 30 minutes of activity. So if you can't get your exercise in, have a teaspoon of turmeric. And, um, and you, we know that plants are really important. So leafy green plants are really important for a couple of reasons. One, they have nitrous oxide, which is really important for our endothelial cells. So they keep our endothelial cells from stiffening up. Um, they also have vitamin K. So uh, we think that vitamin K is really important for keeping our, um, not only our bones healthy, but our arteries and blood vessels healthy. Um, people ask about, what about fish? Like, why isn't fish on this list? Uh, by far the largest study ever done comparing fish oil uh, found no effects on our heart health. Um, so this is consistent with studies that looked at whole fish consumption as well. So overall, there's no significant association between eating fish and endothelial cell function. And women um, have worse arterial function if they eat fish. So uh, women who ate fish more than twice a week have significantly impaired endothelial function. So broccoli, kale, cabbage all contain vitamin K, and that is um, really important for artery function. <clears throat> Whole grains are really important, especially compared to refined grains. Many studies have found that including whole grains can benefit your heart health. And three or more servings of whole grains a day um, significantly reduces uh, systolic blood pressure. Berries are really rich in antioxidants and beans, which are high in starch, reduce levels of cholesterol and triglycerides. And green tea, we know that three cups of coffee a day is also good for our heart health. So lots of great things you can eat to improve your heart health. And we know that exercise, so people often associate aerobic exercise with heart health, but uh, resistance training also is important for heart health. Not only is that the more muscle you have, the better able you are to pump blood, blood back to your heart, which means that your heart has to work less hard. But if you do both aerobic and resistance training, um, you are improving your endothelial cell function as well as improving your heart function and the, your muscles ability to plump blood, blood back to your heart. So we know that a uh, healthy lifestyle is the most important thing you could do. So food choices are really important. Exercise is really important and losing weight is really important. So every pound of weight that you gain um, means that you are making another eight kilometers of blood vessels. So if your heart beats 100,000 times a day, uh, that's 500,000 miles a day for one pound of fat. So fat definitely is um, impacting our heart health. So 10 pounds overweight, that's a lot. Your blood pressure goes up, the heart attack rate goes up. So any weight loss is better for our heart. <clears throat> Researchers found that healthy young people that only have 10 pounds of fat, specifically if it's abdominal fat, are at risk of developing endothelial cell function and having heart disease, and that uh, we're finding heart disease in much younger people now, unfortunately, because of our lifestyles. So eating for heart health, we want to make sure that uh, we eat lots of plants um, because they don't have any saturated fat in them. We want to make sure that we eat lots of plants because they have lots of potassium and potassium is very good for our heart health. We want to make sure that we're not eating too much sodium. Um, and here's a um, bonus question and you can type it in the chat box. In the United States, not in Canada, but in the United States, um, you can type in what do you think is the food that has the um, most sodium consumed by Americans. So what is the number one sodium consuming food in the United States? Um, this, is not, this is not the Canadian answer. Um, so we wanna make sure that we eat lots of fiber and uh, you know, all, the regular, all the regular things that keep us healthy. <clears throat> So we wanna, for our heart health and for our fitness, we wanna make sure that we're exercising at the right intensity at the right time. It's easy to go too hard and it's easy to go not hard enough. 
that we maintain our health, a healthy weight and our muscles, um, that we reduce abdominal fat and that you know your numbers. So often people will say, oh, my doctor has told me that my HDL is too low. That is not the most important number. It is more important to have low cholesterol and low LDL, so the bad kind of cholesterol, than it is to improve your HDL. That is, um, it's popular to think that you need to raise your HDL, but that is, it's, it's, it's important, but it's not as, it doesn't need the emphasis that it gets. Knowing what your cholesterol and LDL is and trying to get as low as you can is much more important. And obviously knowing what your blood pressure is and keeping that low is important. But um, trying to raise your HDL is not the critical component. All right, 